Did the ancients possess their own advanced technologies? From the incredible microscopic precision of the cut megalithic stones, to the movement and raising of these stones, to the Saqqara bird model found in ancient Egypt, to their advanced knowledge of the cosmos. Being as intelligent as we are, and having at times hundreds, even thousands of years of continuous civilization, it might be difficult to imagine them not having an advanced knowledge and understanding, at least in certain areas. In this video, we'll discuss one of the most incredible claims passed down in legends from antiquity, namely that the ancients harnessed the energy in ley lines to levitate huge stones and other objects in the air. In the book Atlantis, Insights from a Lost Civilization, author and explorer Shirley Andrews compiles various accounts of the legendary empire of Atlantis, describing an incredible early culture and their technological achievements. Now this may be seen as fringe or even as pseudo-history, but let's keep an open mind as even myths and legends are often based on nuggets of truth to a lesser or even greater degree. In my past videos, I've discussed the concept and development of levitation based on sonics and electromagnetism. Levitation has often been given as an explanation to the nearly inexplicable and effective way in which ancient engineers and builders moved and placed multi-ton blocks without the aid of our modern technology. But if it's even remotely possible that the ancients but that possessed the knowledge of this incredible technique. How could it have been accomplished? Let's look at some of the very intriguing accounts mentioned in Shirley Andrews' book on Atlantis. According to the book, the inhabitants of Atlantis had a level of technology significantly eclipsing our own modern technology, at least in certain ways. Especially interesting are the accounts of the Atlanteans' travel technology and includes airplanes, submarines, and even conveyances which worked on the principles of levitation. Reading an excerpt under the section entitled Levitation, it says that the Atlanteans employ energy from sound waves to lift their bodies and move short distances in the air. Antigravity metal discs, similar to small trays, were tuned to the vibrations of a person when they were still a small child. Their voices and mental concentration provided the vibrations necessary for movement. When they sang the correct notes and simultaneously struck the disc, they rose from the ground and moved in the air. Andrew says that knowledge of these plates has passed down through the ages, preserved and represented by uh, stories such as the Arabian Nights and the Flying Carpets. Another reference to 
the curious metallic conveyances is as follows. It says, folklore in Great Britain recalls that a special metal plate helped people fly down the path of a ley line. An idea of the composition and physical characteristics of at, of at least some of these plates is given further in this section. In 1519, the Aztec king gave Cortes two flat discs of pure gold. The plates were 10 inches in diameter, round and with rough edges. One was a quarter inch thick, the other was thinner. Now the interesting thing about uh, these plates that were described is that uh, 10 inches isn't very large. It would be unlikely able to actually fit a person that was standing on it. But it may still have given uh, somewhat of an idea of the shape and composition. Uh, especially considering that they were made of gold, which is a non-ferrous metal. So if we think back to uh, some of my videos on magnetic levitation, the descriptions of this process or technique becomes even more intriguing. So as we recall, these ley lines described contains the Earth's fluctuating DC telluric currents that are generated by the fluctuating geomagnetic field. These fluctuating electrical currents generate the varying magnetic fields which generate eddy currents in electrical conductors which in turn create the counter magnetic fields that repel the initial magnetic fields thus producing levitation. Thus it might at least loosely follow that placing a plate made of gold which is a non, again a non-ferrous metal over these fluctuating energy containing ley lines might cause the plates to levitate although it would be questionable if these currents would produce strong enough magnetic fields in the first place, and even more questionable that the levitation forces, even if strong enough, would be stable. But nevertheless, let's humor the idea for a few moments. So we know that fluctuating, uh, fluctuating magnetic fields produce the eddy currents and counter-magnetic fields in the metals. Now considering the proposed resonant qualities of these alleged plates, it might also follow that by striking them as described, a powerful resonance could be set up which would agitate the plate even further in the presence of the already fluctuating geomagnetic fields. The question is, would this extra vibratory energy strengthen the electromagnetic reaction? In other words, would the extra quivering of the plates via resonance enhance the change in the magnetic fields. As we see according to the equation here that the greater the change in the geomagnetic field or any magnetic field the stronger would be the reaction. This will be an interesting experiment but let's delve deeper into Andrew's description of these ley lines. Further in the book she explains that UFOs tend to travel over certain straight lines which have magnetic characteristics across the Earth's surface. It is likely that extraterrestrials taught Atlanteans to channel fluctuating magnetic energy surrounding the Earth and move it along tracks for their own use. There is no evidence of another civilization in prehistoric times sufficiently advanced to construct the tracks now referred to as ley lines. The ley lines of England are well known, but these perfectly straight human-made paths are visible from air on every continent. The lines stretch for hundreds of miles over all sorts of terrain, deep into valleys and directly up high hills, and are precisely aligned in one direction. Little is remembered about the strange ley lines except that mysterious currents, perhaps channeled magnetic energy, flow along the paths. The book goes on to say that at times when the sun shines directly down one of these courses at sunrise, the druids rose in the air and moved along them. Combining the power from their minds with magnetic energy and sound vibrations, it is imaginable that Atlanteans and their descendants moved the large objects as well as themselves in the air along these ley lines. This description of the sun enhancing the energy within these ley lines it's interesting because in my video personal levitation vehicle or PLV we read of how this telluric energy 
is greatly affected by the sun. We might also recall how intense solar activity, like solar flares, stresses the geomagnetic field, causing a significant increase in the strength of these telluric currents. Thus there is a celestial connection between these earth energies and celestial events that's even acknowledged by science. The book seems to confirm this fact by saying that there was an additional reason for the, the emphasis on astronomy in Atlantis and other ancient societies. The amount of energy in Earth's magnetic field is directly affected by the relative positions of the sun, moon, and the planets. For instance, at the time of a full moon, magnetic activity is stronger near noon and quieter at sunset. But when an eclipse takes place, as that magnetic activity normally stimulated by the eclipse body decreases, the flow of energy decreases. Advanced warning of eclipses was essential, essential to Atlanteans, for if an eclipse occurred, the energy conducted along ley lines suddenly weakened and all movement over these mysterious paths immediately ceased. Objects and people in the air would crash to the ground. The precise placement of pillars in many of the stone circles in Great Britain reveals the accuracy with which prehistoric astrologers predicted lunar eclipses. Terror of the effects of eclipses was so strong in ancient times that a similar anxiety is still prevalent even in modern times. In other words, this might be one of the major reasons why the ancients were so intent on astronomical alignment when placing and constructing monuments and predicting celestial events. But again, the reason might follow that these telluric electromagnetic reactions would take place. The question is still whether or not the interactions would be strong enough to do what is claimed in the incredible accounts given by Andrews. And if not, would there be ways to artificially strengthen these telluric currents and the resulting magnetic fields by several orders? Once again, to refer to the video, Personal Levitation Vehicle, I described a possibility using Tesla's wireless world power system in which electromagnetic energy generated by magnifying uh, coils will be fed into the earth along grid or ley lines at resonance. However, this may not be the only method. Going back a few moments in this video, I mentioned the possibility of resonating a conducting body within a magnetic field, which would create eddy currents and their counter magnetic fields in that same non-ferrous conducting body. Now, considering that the Earth itself is a giant cavity, then we know that there are both sonic and electrical frequencies at which the Earth will resonate. The Earth is also essentially a giant magnet with a massive encompassing magnetic field. Thus it might follow that the re by resonating the cavity of the Earth would also cause the geomagnetic field to resonate more powerfully. So the question is, will resonating the Earth with man-made sonic vibrations also agitate its magnetic field in a similar manner to solar flares to increase the energy within the telluric currents by several orders. Sufficient enough to be tapped for both wireless energy as well as electromagnetic levitation. And if so, what is being described here? A type of wireless world geomaglev transportation system? This geomaglev concept is indeed very interesting, but it does bring up a number of questions. Firstly, how would this energy be conducted? Would it be able to travel through the earth with enough strength on its own to be effective? Or would the paths need to be modified? Let's go back earlier in the discussion where the book details the ley lines where it says that the Atlanteans learned to channel fluctuating magnetic energy and move it along tracks for their own use. The book here suggests that these tracks had to be constructed. 
So the question is, what were these tracks? How were they constructed? And what were they made of? We know that ferrous metals and perhaps paramagnetic materials like granite and basalt can help guide magnetic fields. Were these field guiding materials spaced out in a way as to conduct and strengthen the Earth's field lines? We also know that non-ferrous metals can conduct electrical currents, though they are not strongly affected by static magnetic fields. Were non-ferrous metals buried in the Earth to, prov to provide a better medium of conductivity for the currents generated by the fluctuating geomagnetic field? Or were these tracks actually magnetic flux generators themselves, again buried in the natural landscape, similar to the demonstration here? The flux generator buried in this demonstration allows for flotation in only one point of three-dimensional space. But it does give us a striking visual of what the levitation technique would look like on a small scale. But to make it mobile and useful as a transportation system it would involve energizing a number of buried flux generators in a manner similar to the magnetic river concept developed by electrical engineer Eric Lathwaite and his team, and in which I had some success in duplicating here. I will go into more detail uh, of the magnetic river concept in a future video. But according to Andrews, the incredible technologies of Atlantis were not powered by coils or wire, but instead by special crystals that were a powerful source of both electromagnetic and vibrational energy. So the key words here are vibrational energy. Because if the electromagnetic energy that is said to have been generated by these crystals were in the form of a steady state DC magnetic field, then that field would of course have no effect on non-ferrous metals unless they or the crystals were moved in relation to each other. So since these crystals could be resonated, then by vibrating them, a fluctuating time varying electromagnetic field should be produced which could then be tapped for both levitation via Lenz's law as well as wireless energy via Faraday's law of induction. This is similar to the modern maglev train in which coils in the system's guideway which when energized by alternating current function to lift as well as propel the train along. Peripheral coils could also be placed on the train itself which will receive energy from the AC coils, enabling them to power features on board the train, thus serving two purposes, lifting propelling, and propelling the train along, as well as powering the train's aux auxiliary electrical systems. If these power crystals did exist, they would have to have been both plentiful in order to create such a vast transportation system and themselves likely powered by a vast and renewable energy source such as solar energy and or perhaps the harvesting of vibrations via the process of piezoelectricity. This may sound unbelievable at first, but let's consider the document here which discusses how nano-coated salt crystals can be used to store the energy from heat in chemical form which could then be later released, a process that engineers believe can be scaled up to the megawatt level. They discuss the use of heat energy uh, in the form of waste from nuclear plants, which could be stored in this salt crystal medium. But in addition to utilizing the waste heat from industrial and nuclear plants, I also see this concept being expanded to include the vast heat energy which can be provided by the sun. We already know that temperatures of thousands of degrees can be reached with using simple parabolic reflectors. In my last video, the electromagnetic hovercraft, I discussed the magnitude of this solar energy which amounts to about 430 billion billion joules of energy 
striking the earth every single hour. Additionally, solar panels are made of silicon crystals. So though the power crystals of Atlantis may at first sound far-fetched, we can see that crystals actually do have the ability to both harness and store tremendous amounts of energy from the sun. The text also mentions that the ley lines were perfectly straight, further implying something artificial, as there are few natural features that can be characterized as being perfectly straight, especially over long distances. It is said here that it took immense time and effort to construct the, light, the ley lines all over the earth, but there seems to be scant information on their composition or construction methods. But the natural question is, what could have happened to such a vast levitational transportation system? Where is the evidence of it? Where are the tracks? Well, Atlantis sunk, so we could assume that its power system is at the bottom of the ocean. In fact, some people have theorized that the electromagnetic anomalies which occur in the Bermuda Triangle, such as compass interference on ships and aircraft, and strange lights, is caused by Atlantis's sunken power crystals. Now this may be a reasonable assumption as far as Atlantis, but what happened to the levitational systems of later ancient societies? Are they buried beneath m many meters of mud and silt caused by the Great Flood? And if so, do they cause similar anomalies over land as occurs over the ocean in the Bermuda Triangle? But according to the book, one thing is for certain. Levitation was one of the ley lines' extraordinary functions, allowing metallic plates and any people or objects upon these plates to rise in the air just above the earth. Psychic Edgar Casey, the source of much of the information in this book, details of incredible flying vehicles in the times of Atlantis. Referring to his alleged descriptions of these vehicles, Andrews describes a flying machine that resembled a low flat sled. This sled was capable of carrying heavy loads about 30 feet above the ground for long distances in a straight line. So again, two of the key words here are straight line, implying that the machine flew with the aid of the magnetic energy within perfectly straight ley lines. It's also interesting that it described as having the ability to carry heavy loads for long distances. Heavy loads as in tons of heavy building material for use in constructing megalith. This brings up an interesting point, the logistics of megalith building. Even if by chance the ancients did have a technique of levitation, they would still need the ability to bring in a large amount of material to the building site upon each arrival. Some historians have claimed that such large constructions may have taken generations, even centuries, to construct. This might seem reasonable at first, but is it realistic or practical? If constructing, constructing these edifices was so vitally important to the existence of the society, then it was vital, vital that they be completed. The way I see it, it might become less likely that a large site could be completed in its entirety if the construction process spanned many generations. What are the chances that the precise construction methods could be successfully transmitted from one generation to the next? What if the plans were lost? This would especially be an issue if the society had no written language like the Inca. So much information will have to remain intact as it is being transmitted over the generations. The orientation and alignment of the sites, for instance, the precision construction methods, etc. Many of these edifices are constructed with such a precision, precision that has a high probability of being lost if building spans over too long a period of time. 
it just seems to me that there had to been a quicker and more efficient way to complete these massive construction projects. As we do today, large amounts of material needs to be brought in at one time, such as on large barges or the aforementioned sleds. The building materials will have to be brought in and stacked up around the periphery of the construction site with the builders constantly taking material from these stacks. Now while the builders are working, the people who brought in the materials would then go back out to the quarries where another army of people are working to separate materials from the bedrock, pick up these materials, and then set out to the building site once again for drop off. Schedules will have to be made and maintained as well as adjusted to ensure as smooth a process as possible with not too little material being brought in which will result in idle workers at the construction site nor do you want too much material which would cause pile up around the site's periphery and overwhelm the builders. So whether they were pulled and pushed over land, floated in the water, or floated in the air over the earth's surface, these barges and or sleds would have had to have been large enough to bring in massive amounts of materials and goods in repeated intervals over a significant time, a process which would allow even the largest megaliths to be constructed within a generation. Another interesting detail about these flying sleds was that it was alleged to have been steered from the surface. This brings to mind a sort of conveyance seen here in Star Wars The Phantom Menace. The levitating sled guided and steered by large animals and or people, or perhaps even a wheeled ground vehicle like in my demonstration here. I call this the maglev sled. Another characteristic that could be deduced is that the flying sled, if steered from the surface, could not have traveled faster than the animals, people, or vehicles guiding it. Thus it would not have been able to travel fast enough to make use of downdrafts of air like the ground effect cargo planes invented here by Russia. These planes can carry up to 500 tons and travel just above the Earth's surface at an altitude of about 30 feet, relying on powerful downdrafts of air generated and trapped between the craft and the ground to stay afloat. But a device like this relies on adequate speed to stay above the ground. The heavy sled described doesn't seem to be speed dependent. Thus it seems to rely on some form of levitation, perhaps provided by electromagnetism, anti or negative gravity as envisioned in this sled in the Phantom Menace clip. The next part says that small planes that carried one to two people and were energized and directed by power crystals also existed in the legendary nation. Planes which flew two to three feet above the ground which could have achieved lift from downdrafts like the Russian ground effect cargo plane or levitation like in Luke Skywalker's land speeder. Or perhaps even both principles were employed like in a winged hovercraft also known as a hover wing. And like a hover wing, a levitation vehicle constructed with wings or a large bottom surface area would achieve higher lift when it reaches a critical forward speed. In fact, one might also wonder if the creators of Star Wars were inspired by these accounts. But nevertheless, these are fascinating tales, which if they reflect any degree of truth at all, may finally answer a number of questions concerning the ancients' astounding ability to transport such heavy and cumbersome materials. But it also brings up a host of other peculiar questions, not the least of which for me is 
How did Edgar Casey know? If not just outright fabrications, how did he know of such specific details? Was he truly psychic? Or was he simply privy to arcane knowledge passed down from ancient times, preserved and hidden in underground cults and secret societies? Was the claim of psychic ability designed to simply conceal and protect the sources of this incredible information? Will we ever know the truth? Okay, so let's do a quick recap. Shirley Andrews' accounts of levitation in Atlantis seems to describe a type of geomaglev transportation system based on the magnetic energies within ley lines. I believe that much of the folklore concerning ley lines may reflect fragments of real information that was once known about the Earth's magnetic fields and its telluric currents. I believe that the ancients developed ex expert knowledge about Earth energies and their relationships to celestial events. So this may have been a real highly developed science at one time, which over time and possibly after numerous ancient upheavals and catastrophes was gradually lost in its more complete form, surviving today only as pseudo-scientific fragments represented in folklore, legends, and modern astrology. If this is the case, then the only way to regain this lost knowledge is to take the surviving fragments and subject them to the real world experiments. In this way, we would at least have a place to start and we would, be, we would be able to rediscover the real scientific principles upon which these fragments are based. So we already know that the earth has telluric currents, so we should start here. In this diagram, we see posts of dissimilar metals placed in the ground at different depths from each other. An imaginary line connecting them is in the direction of magnetic inclination, which is required to generate the greatest voltages and currents. We can also imagine the earth between the posts as a type of resistor. The resistance, of course, would be likely very significant. Now, if we overlaid a piece of non-ferrous metal across the earth between these posts and connect it to the posts via wires, it might follow that the telluric currents would now be flowing through two different paths. This setup would essentially reflect two parallel res resistances in which the lower resistance will conduct the greater current, in this case the non-ferrous metal. Now if we find that this is the case, the next step would be, be to see how these telluric currents could be increased and enhanced. So we should do an extensive catalog of the strength of the currents during different celestial events, such as solar storms, in which the currents should greatly spike. We should also try resonating the Earth sonically as aforementioned to see if this will artificially stress the geomagnetic field, hence enhancing the telluric currents similar to the way a solar flare would. An additional enhancement to the system might be to alter the straight track into a metallic spiral or even a concentric coil. We can see in these pictures here that the ancients were indeed familiar with spiral forms and symbols and that being quite versed in ancient lore, Nikola Tesla may have been inspired by these symbols as well, uh, centuries later when he developed his uh, coils and magnifying transformers. This coil would of course increase the number of field lines resulting in stronger geomagnetic field strength generated from the telluric currents. Now if we were successful in this, and the system can effectively be used to repel a non-ferrous plate placed right above it, the next challenge to tackle would be stability. A technique called a magnetic river, developed by electrical engineer Eric Lathwaite and his team several decades ago, utilizes two or more coils to levitate a piece of non-ferrous metal in what is called a zone of stability. Simply put, 
The plate is put in a region just off center and between the coils where the magnetic field is slightly weaker compared to the outside. This generates a, a type of magnetic force field and attempting to push the plate out of this region would be like pushing a bolt up an embankment, hence the term magnetic river. I will go into more detail on this technique in a future video. So after we realize stability, all that will be needed then is to develop a way to store the energy that will be generated from spikes in the telluric currents via increased solar activity, resonance, or any other methods that we might stumble across during our studies. Huge capacitors and or crystals could be used to store this energy that would otherwise go completely to waste. Like in an ordinary electronic circuit, the capacitors would also function to smooth out the energy spikes, providing a steady and reliable source of geoelectricity. Needless to say, realizing this would be a monumental task, it would require an exhaustive study of the geoelectricity and how to interface it with our modern technology. But I am certain that not only would it be possible to recover uh, this lost geotechnology, but also we would develop a newfound respect for our planet and this ability to, to provide for us. Now I have no idea how long it would take us to redevelop this lost geotechnology. It would probably take decades. But if I were tasked with the designing a maglev system today, inspired by the stories of Atlantis, but without having the necessary expertise to utilize the telluric currents, I would start by laying tracks of non-ferrous metals, mostly in straight lines, just under the Earth's surface. These tracks would stretch for hundreds, if even thousands of miles, and would be made to accommodate welded branch-off points, or branch-off tracks, which could go into more remote areas. Uh, within which we might want to transport heavy materials. The tracks would actually be made of two parallel tracks placed together so that there is a slip parallel to the plane of travel. This would enable me to employ what I call the three coil lift and stabilization method that I first demonstrated in my last video, the electromagnetic hovercraft. The center coil levitates over the slip due to Lenz's law as usual, but it is stabilized in what <clears throat> is called a zone of lower magnetic force compared to the regions over the solid portions of the plates. The reason for this is because the induced currents from the oscillating coil are conducted less efficiently near the slit and near any edges than they are over the solid parts. With the stronger magnetic force on the opposite sides and the weaker force directly in the center over the slip, the coil can float stably within this zone of lower energy. This follows as we recall in science that objects most often tend to seek a lower energy level. Now while stable, the weaker currents result in significantly less lift. I developed a technique to rectify this consisting of a coil placed on either side of the center coil so that it rests directly over the solid faces of the track. Attaching all three coils to a sled substructure and we have a functioning maglev. The outer two coils being over solid conducting regions will experience full magnetic repulsive force allowing us to regain the lost levitation height lost through stabilization. This technique can also be called a type of magnetic river, though it is a little different from Eric Lathwaite's version. Now to power the system, I would design a vast solar energy system made from intermittent and interconnected solar stations. Enormous capacitors would store the energy from the sun so that the system could work both at night as well as during eclipses. The energy is then fed into modulating circuits 
turning solar direct current into solar alternating current or fluctuating direct current. The AC or modulated DC would then be received by the maglev sled inductively through either contactless inductive cables that are parallel to the tracks or more desirably a highly developed and fully functioning wireless energy transfer system. Besides the solar energy, this system is completely artificial and is sort of a cop-out in that it does not utilize telluric energy, which would be ideal. But it at least shows that such a system is indeed possible even with the science that we have now, though it would still be a monumental task. In either system, the maglev sled would float freely in mid-air due to the stabilizing properties of the magnetic river technique and thus would not need the added expense of building and maintaining a containment guideway or track for stability. Instead, it is electromagnetically stabilized. This will require a much greater engineering skill to implement than just using guideways, but in the end, it would greatly reduce construction costs and maintenance. Such, such a system would accommodate not only regular travel, but also the transportation of heavy materials far and wide, potentially even to remote areas, which may be difficult for more conventional transport methods to reach. The question is, is if a similar system, but using the magnetic energy within ley lines, was developed and used at some point in antiquity. But even if it is complete fiction, we are still aware of the power of fiction to inspire reality.